welcome the President and Chief Love Officer at Kirikos & Associates, Mia Kirikos, in conversation with Skift President Carolyn Kremens. Love officer. I love that title. I want that title. I want to be a love officer. Mia, did a year really pass since we had a conversation here at Design the Future? It, it, a year. And it literally, I think we blinked and we went from one cup of tea to another cup of tea. So <laughs> exactly. So listen, since that conversation we had last December, it seems like wellness and travel has gained even more momentum and is dominating even more of the conversation today than it did even a year ago. So you just keynoted the Global Wellness Summit last week. What, let's start with what are what were some of the biggest um, conversations or some of the surprising takeaways that you heard? Well, I mean, really, I mean, it was, it was actually a very exciting conference and I was sort of surprised at the amount of attendance, but I think people were just thirsty to get back together and the theme was really attractive. It was about the new new era in health and wellness because COVID's only served as a catalyst for all things well. Um, and it was clear that wellness was on the top of mind for all executives across all verticals. You know, they had public, private uh, attendees from, you know, public and private entities, academia, you know, we we're in Harvard's backyard and MIT and others that were there, science, economists, artists, you name it. Um, travel and hospitality, of course, that's where some of the deepest roots are, um, were there really eager to talk about the intersection of wellness, well-being, travel, hospitality, science, um, medicine, and technology, so much more. It was really exciting. Yeah. So, so you know, you, um, you, you said that, um, that the pandemic definitely cemented wellness, right, into the consumer mindset. And yeah, wellness tourism and services have been hit really hard, right? Because of the safety um, reasons. And and so I'm just wondering, you know, is there a way um, or an opportunity to build better as wellness or services return? Uh, yes and yes. Yes on what you said at the start and yes to the question. Um, in fact, you know, there was new research that was released last week by the Global Wellness Institute um, that really did show some constriction in the overall wellness economy from four and a half trillion to 4.4 trillion. And wellness tourism, of course, logically took the biggest hit because, um, you know, probably by like 30 or 40 percent because of slowdowns in travel. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also poised for some of the biggest gains because before the pandemic, you know, wellness tourism was already growing twice as fast as global tourism. Now imagine the pandemic came, shut things down, um, reminded everyone how important their health and well-being is. And now I think the, the travelers are really fueled by, you know, their quest for nature and mental and physical and emotional well-being, but also revenge travel. And there's a huge opportunity to think about wellness and well-being, both for travel and hospitality and also travelers. Um, beyond spa fitness pool, or even like healthy food in the restaurant. And there's just a huge opportunity to rethink the overall uh, travel experience and, and how we cater to it moving forward. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually um, doing this interview from the Carillon Wellness um, Resort, and they've just come out with this whole suite of like contactless treatments and stuff, which is super cool, um, but yeah. It's hard to think about it like a massage without contact, but you know, mind, body, wellness. So there's a lot and of innovation. Well, it's 28 degrees here in Maine right now, so you're not my favorite person, as I see from <laughs> Miami. And I've I'm, been where you are, so everyone should be envying Carolyn right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not doing this from the jacuzzi, but <laughs> <laughs> in any case, you know, you, you um, I, I know that you talk a lot, um, you know, within the industry, and you certainly. Um, speak how the industry needs to take a more holistic approach towards well wellness, right? Not just thinking about wellness as an amenity or an add-on, but becoming full-fledged profit centers. So can can you give us an example? Like what is what does a holistic model look like and what could growth look like in the in the decade ahead? Sure. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. In a lot of ways we've sort of compartmentalized wellness, particularly when we started, you know, 
I mean, wellness was really offered only at the spa and those four walls, and it was treated as amenity, not as a, as a business. And now you have companies, you have brands, you have hotels really looking to make wellness part of its core DNA and why you would select them to um, actually, you know, take part in their travel experience. Um, and really, I think what we're seeing is the rise in wellness travel can be the primary purpose of your trip. Instead of consuming a massage as part of a family vacation or, you know, staying on your fitness routine as, as you take part in a work trip or attend a conference. Um, it's, it's really a huge opportunity where holistically people will be contemplating their entire experience um, and really selecting destinations that can leave their wellness and well-being much, much stronger in the coming months. And it's, I think, as I said, it's the it's the pent up demand, but it's also traveler demand for all things well. That they're really looking at travel and hospitality as a source for wellness and well being versus just something they they consume along the way. Yeah, you know, we've um, throughout this um, conference today, uh, there are a lot of speakers have been talking about um, the broader connection with community and with the planet, and so. When you think about wellness, right, it's, it's obviously not just about self, it's about wellness for your community, it's wellness for the planet. Um, and, you know, so when you think about the business of wellness, right, and it's so much more interconnected today, um, how do you design for that? Well, I mean, you hit the, again, the nail on the head. I think you used a great word, which is interconnectedness. Um, it's key for us to understand um, because, you know, we really do, don't always look at the big picture, look at this holistically and systemically. And I actually have um, a couple slides that we can bring up um, to talk about this. Um, but really, when you think about 21st century organizations post pandemic, they have a responsibility now to contemplate the wellness and well being of people community and planet. And so for people, you know, really looking at leaders, colleagues, consumers, um, everyone holistically and how we can really better their health and well-being for the community. You know, we're, we're fostering these tribes of consumers out there, um, different cultures, and really thinking about how we operate in our backyards. And then the planet, you know, along the way, while we're caring for for the wellness and well-being of people and community, we need to be stewards really to um, the planet because it's limited resources that we haven't been doing a great job of protecting, right? And so on the on the next slide, because of this, because of this demand that we're expecting, we say we are attempting to foster ecosystems of well-being that look something like this. And it starts with the leaders. So if you look in the top I guess it would be left of the screen for everyone who's watching. Um, if you start with leader well-being and they're actually modeling health and wellness, they're making it a priority. They're not just delivering business results, but they're also um, taking time to celebrate their holidays, their travel experiences, um, and also prioritize their health and wellness and share some of their own habits. Um, employees are then going to feel like they have the permission to take advantage of the workplace wellness programs, the Headspace app, step away from their for, from their desk for a walking meeting, whatever it is, um, they're going to be happier, more productive um, in the workforce. They're going to be less absent, and that mentality of positivity is going to go into the policies, the brands, the products and services that they deliver to consumers. Consumers are then going to consume those products and services. Their health and well-being will rise. And they're going to buy more from you because they don't just care about those products and services, as we've seen with Gen Z and Gen Y and millennials. They're going to be um, wanting to have a relationship with you because they believe you care for your colleagues and the planet as well. That in turn raises community um, health, it raises company performance, they'll have more money to give back to the communities um, within which they operate. And the cycle just repeats over and over again, making wellness and well-being part of your DNA. And you know, people will ultimately care for you just like you've you've cared um, for the for the planet and for the business at large. So, you know, we we really say this is the big picture now. It's the lens that we look at to foster wellness and well-being for companies of all kinds, whether they come in the door of employee well-being or customer well-being or community well-being. You know, my job is ultimately to get them to see the whole picture. Yeah, 
I mean, this makes really good sense. I have to say I, I'm guilty as charged. I, about a year ago, um, I have a weekly uh, meeting with another executive at the company and we decided together that we were gonna make them a walking meeting. And I think a year went by and I don't think we've ever had one meeting that we were actually outside walking. So I know that it's something that we need to work on and especially from the top, but so tell me who's doing it well. Like, can you give us an example, especially within the travel industry, like who, you know, this is a beautiful way of seeing how leadership and, and then it sets the tone for employees and ultimately to your customers. Who who lives and breathes this model? Um, I think, you know, I would say they've done this organically over time. I think the team at Six Senses Hotels and Resorts have done a really mm -hmm. good job of this as an example. Um, you know, they've always been sort of conscious for the environment and, you know, they've done a great job of of making wellness part of the DNA of their programs, their products and services commercially, but they've also started to really think of these other pieces on the employee side of the equation. Um, they really are starting to to look at um, how best to foster that uh, moving forward, I think more holistically. And I think other companies, there's other examples of that, but, but they were the first ones that came to mind. Mm hmm Right. Um, so I think we have an audience question that I'm just getting here, which basically says that um, uh, uh, are you seeing more providers as willing to adopt the principles of the um, ecosystem of well-being? So you mentioned six senses, but are you seeing uh, are people starting to at least, you know, talk about it? Because it always starts with that. Right. Yeah, I think what people are talking about is not necessarily ecosystems of well-being. That's our term and it's our trademark and it's our job to 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 take a step back and really look at each company's different ecosystem because everyone has one that's proprietary. But what people are talking about, and this was a theme from last week, um, and I think you're seeing it in popular business press as well, is that we are really responsible for caring of wellness of well-being of workforces that are now hybrid in nature, more remote. We're seeing them talk about how we've had to really care about um, the wellness of, of the planet, of course, and sustainability for quite some time. A big theme, as we all know, that came up was um, DE&I, um, diversity, equality, inclusion. Um, you know, I, I say we, we can't get lost in Alphabet City of ESG and SDG and DE&I. We have to instead really think about not these as silo programs, but again, how is this affecting the wellness and well-being of all the stakeholders that your business touches? And it doesn't have to be a public business. It can be nonprofit. It can be academia. Academia it could be a community. You really could look at this model across those. And I think people are aware of the responsibility, but they don't yet know how to solve it because we're not used to working yet in this way, thinking holistically and systematically you know, as the slides just demonstrated. Yeah, so you bring up a really good point and that's around inequity and uh, wellness has often been targeted, you know, for the elite, right? And it's typically, you know, you're paying a premium price tag. So it is, you know, naturally gonna go towards those who are, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, are, are more exclusive and whatever, but that's not actually not a very good perception, um, you know, uh, and or reality for that matter of um, the world we're living in today with all the growing inequities. So, uh, you know, is, is this accurate first and foremost? And um, how how do we as an industry make wellness more inclusive and accessible? Right. Well, um, I well, I'll answer I'll answer that question. But I have one thing I just have to add, Carolyn, to the last question you asked me on who's doing it well, and I would be remiss if I did not call out. Mandarin Oriental, because one of my dear colleagues is out there, um, Jeremy McCarthy, who I work closely with at Starwood. And I just bring that up because they too are another great example um, around the globe. And there's there's others. I think a lot of people are doing great things there, um, even with IHG and, and a bunch of others. But to answer your question, you're right. I mean, this, is, this was a huge topic that we talked about last week. I talked about with my clients. The reality is this. Um, the future of work is not about what we do or where anymore. It's about how. It's actually why my title is Chief Love Officer. You know, how we treat each other, how we show up in the communities that we serve um, and where we recruit our talent, right? How we see people who have historically felt unseen and how we care for the planet along the way. 
you know, this is what we really need to reconsider. It's not the what anymore. It's about the how. And, you know, I say this all the time, you know, love is not some touchy feely thing that can only be in the bedroom. We have to bring it into the boardroom. It's a proven business strategy. Um, things like gratitude and awe and inspiration and all these things um, really actually do impact the top line and the bottom line. But we've lost sight in our you know, vigor to develop hotels and properties or think about the physical design of a plane or any of the different components of the travel experience, we've lost sight of how we work and how we treat each other. And that's really what the, you know, the next several years should be about. Right. I mean, so on that point, I mean, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, the great the great assessment, right? We all uh, have rethought, including myself, like, you know, yeah your own personal health and wellness and happiness and quality of life. And, you know, and we're, we're taking all the things that we've been living and breathing and thinking about. And then, you know, when, when, while travel is coming back, you want to start to like not lose sight of um, these priorities. So, um, you know, how has the travel industry evolved to support this need? Like, are, are you starting to see the industry start tapping into these other areas more than just like a great room or a great, you know, spa, what have you? Um, I'm going to say not enough yet, you know, as part of the great reassessment, a lot of um, people, particularly in hospitality, are reassessing um, the work climate and what it really took to work in the business of, of hospitality and travel. And some of them are choosing to leave the industry and we need to give them back. So I think we have a lot to do, I would say, on the colleague side of the equation, but I would say on the consumer side of the equation and really what the industry needs to do is realize how much the world has changed, like how we're working has changed, that people are in hybrid situations. Some of them are in perfectly remote um, locations and their wellness and well-being is fueled by seeing new places and experiencing new cultures, um, living a more nomadic lifestyle, right? So um, that really requires longer stays, you know, instead of looking at three and four day average lengths of stay, which is quite common in say the Americas, right? I think we need to look at three and four weeks and three and four months. And we need to really think about the packages, the travel packages um, and the products and services that can change the way work has changed and become so much more flexible um, and that people want to have richer experiences that blend both work and life. Yeah, so you, you know, you said three, three or more weeks, three or more months, you know, what about the real estate that's booming, right? Like people are like also opting in to buy into wellness concept when it comes to their real estate and living, you know, that way. Absolutely, I mean, I think you, um, are living that right? I mean, you're yeah. you're in at uh, the Carolyn and in um, Miami, but you know, I would say much like we've compartmentalized wellness and travel and hospitality as sort of spa, fitness, pools, and hotels, um, we've done the same in residential communities, right? We just try to we gate up the resort community or the golf community, and we build a great fitness center, make sure we have a spa, but it's sort of done reactionary, not with purpose. And I think the future for real estate is very much the same token, um, which will be about purpose-built communities that are being designed with the health and wellness of residents and consumers. Um, you know, places that are really intentionally designed to add length to your life and, and life to your years um, you know, things, communities that are built around uh, gardens or farms, I think you're going to see because people want to be closer to their food sources, um, places that are built around cutting edge uh, cities, you know, medical cities that are known for having the best reactive and proactive care, like hospitals and alternative health and wellness practices. Um, you like, in my opinion, the uh, golf and resort communities are out and intergenerational wellness communities are going to be in. Um, because mm -hmm. if you look at the data and I've, I've seen it across all income levels from like average income levels to, to higher, um, everyone is willing to pay a premium on where they live if they truly believe it's going to somehow impact their health and wellness. And so, um, 
that is, and that's actually wellness lifestyle real estate is what they call it. It's one of the winners, I would say, of the pandemic. It's actually had tons of growth as tourism has actually been down. And that's not going to change anytime soon. It'll touch everything from skyscrapers to full blown out communities because um, it's going to be a way for developers to compete for residents in the future. Yeah, I think I'm somewhere between like Margaritaville <laughs> and Miraval. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> um, no, just kidding. Um, wellness all the way, right? Mm -hmm. um, with a little margaritas thrown in. Yes. Um, so as we um, are, are wrapping up our session, and um, you know, I know that you're a big traveler as well. You know, we're coming upon the end of the year, and. Um, the holidays are right are right here. You know, when you're thinking about where would you want to go right now, like if you could just blink and be there, give me a far flung bucket list place, and then give me something that's like a shorter trip away. Okay. Well, I mean, I no one should feel bad for me because I've been very lucky to see some of the world's best health and wellness destinations, like where you would go if that was the primary purpose of your trip. Um, for work. So it counts. Um, I would say one that's still on my bucket list that I am owed a trip would absolutely be um, Kamalaya in Thailand. Um, it is a very soulful uh, place. Um, and I really think so much of the founders, John and Karina Stewart. So if I had like two weeks to, to just go play, that would be the first place I would get on a plane tomorrow. Um, something closer to home, I would say Oh, that I've not been to yet, um, but I've I've been in her presence, we'll say, is a place that was started by Deborah Zayke. She started Ranch La Puerta in Mexico, which I've been to. But the first one of the, the other places she's founded was the Golden Door in Escondido, California. And I am so wanting to go there, but talk about a, uh, a place that walks the walk and talks the talk. 100% of their profits actually go to charity. So, wow. Um, a place for me to go that's good for me and my health and well-being, but also does good for others is the is the perfect uh, getaway for me um, in 22 for sure. Wow, that's super cool. <laughs> so wait, before we go, I have to ask you about that fabulous um, Santa hat. Are you like a secretly an elf on the side? Are you like a wellness elf or what, what, uh -huh. what can you? Yeah. Yep. So I have to tell you all about this hat. And this is a shout out to my husband, James. My husband had this hat made for me in Prague. You can see like all this amazing netting. Um, he, he had it made for me because he says that I'm such a 12 year old at Christmas that he thinks I'm part elf <laughs> and he thought I needed to have this hat. So um, yeah, it's my favorite hat. It's my most prized possession and it always comes and sits next to me for moments like this. Um, well, Mia, Mia, you wear it well. I wish you a beautiful ho holiday season. My chief love officer, thank you for joining me and uh, speak to you soon. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Good luck to you and the SKIP team. We love you guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.